We have before us a resolution on containment of Iran. Now, I have voted for sanctions on Iran and don't think it's a good idea that Iran have nuclear weapons. However, I'm very concerned about this particular resolution. I think a vote for this resolution is a vote for the concept of preemptive war. I know of no other way to interpret this resolution. The resolution says that containment, the strategy of trying to prevent expansion or invasion of countries, will never be our policy with regard to Iran. While I think it unwise to announce that we will contain Iran, I do think it unwise to tell Iran, oh, it's fine to get a nuclear weapon, we'll contain you. I also think it's equally unwise to say we will never contain you. The reason I say this is that we woke up one day and Pakistan had nuclear weapons. We woke up one day and Russia had nuclear weapons. China and India and North Korea. Had we made the statement, the rash statement, that we will never contain any country that has nuclear weapons, what does that mean? I think that means that you've decided right now before anything happens, you've decided that you will preemptively go to war. We've been at war for a decade now. We've been at war in Afghanistan and I supported going to Afghanistan, but I'm ready to come home from Afghanistan. We were at war in Iraq for nearly 10 years. I'm glad we're coming home from Iraq, but I don't want to automatically commit our country to a war in Iran. So while I do think it's a mistake to say we won't contain them, I think it's also a mistake to say that we will contain them. It's a mistake to have a policy that is explicit one way or the other. President Reagan was once criticized and accused of having no foreign policy. He replied that it wasn't that he had no foreign policy, it was that he didn't care to share it with everyone. Because if you give everyone, your potential enemies or friends, if you say to every country, if you do X, I'll do X, or if you maybe do this, I'll do that, you're exposing exactly what your plans are, and that may not be the best strategy. We don't have to give foreign aid to be connected with the world. We should trade with the world. That's the connection. The more you're interconnected through trade, the less likely you are to go to war. The other side also says that if we don't have foreign aid, we'll have war. Well, my goodness, has anybody been paying attention? We've had two pretty big wars for a decade. We're involved in the longest war in the history of our country. I don't see any evidence that foreign aid is preventing war. Now, some might say, but foreign aid is humanitarian and we want to help poor people. I see zero evidence that foreign aid is helping poor people. It's helping rich people in poor countries. I went through an hour's worth of this earlier talking about how dictators are the ones stealing the money in Africa. Africans live on an average of two dollars a day. They did 30 years ago and they still do because foreign aid doesn't get to the people, it's stolen by the dictators. The other point to make about foreign aid is they're all like, oh my goodness, if we don't have foreign aid, we'll be fighting them on our shores. Because we have foreign aid, we have a great deal of antipathy. What they need to think through, and nobody's thinking through, is why are the Arabs mad? Why are they yelling and screaming and burning the American flag? And it makes me mad. That's one reason I don't want to send them any money, is because they're burning our flag. But why are they mad? They're mad because Mubarak, who was a dictator in Egypt, do you know what he did when the crowds would form? He hosed them down with tear gas made in Pennsylvania, bought with foreign aid. When the police came with truncheons and beat the crap out of you if you were a protester in Egypt, they did it with money from the United States. They're not mad at us because we're rich. They're not mad at us because we drive cars and have nice clothes and have music that they find distasteful. They're really not even ultimately mad at us because of that movie. They don't like it. And I understand their sensibilities on this, but that's not ultimately why they're mad. You get really mad when you're hit over the head with a police truncheon paid for with foreign aid. So it's really exactly the opposite of what the other side says. The other side says, without foreign aid, we'll have more war. I say, because of the foreign aid, we have more war. There's no objective evidence 
Is there any objective evidence that we've had less war with foreign aid? None. Zero. There is a lot of evidence we're out of money, though. We are a trillion dollars in the hole every year, and they all come down, they pay lip service to it, but then they say, oh, well, $30 billion, that won't make a difference. If you don't start somewhere, you've got to start somewhere. Foreign aid's a great place to start. These senators are disconnected from the public. The public, if you talk to them, and I defy any of them that are going to vote to continue foreign aid with no limitations, go home and ask your people. I'll bet you 90% of people at home, it routinely polls in the 70s, are in favor of not sending money overseas. Particularly if you say, do you want to send money overseas to people who despise us? Do you want to send money overseas to people who are burning our flag? Do you want to send money overseas to a country that has tortured a man that helped get Bin Laden? To a country that allowed Bin Laden to live within its midst for six or seven years unmolested? To a country that's mad at us now because we got Bin Laden? To a country where a third of them probably would vote for Bin Laden for president? So I say far from destabilizing the world, what would happen is, if we were to remove foreign aid, we would remove the impetus to the Arab Spring becoming the Arab Winter. What I see is people recognizing that people are angry, but I see no intelligent discussion about why they're angry. When people come to me and they say, it's, oh, it's because you're rich and you're a wealthy country, that doesn't make any sense to me. Many of these people actually in the Arab Spring really do want freedom, a freedom like our freedom. Maybe a little different. I mean, it's a different culture, and they believe in a, a different system of democracy than we do, but they still want some freedom. So you say, if they want freedom and we have freedom, why wouldn't they admire our system? Why wouldn't they be sympathetic? Why are they burning our flag? Why are 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people rallying and burning our flag? It's because too often our foreign aid has gone to support dictators who have oppressed their people. Mubarak got $60 billion in Egypt. His family is worth 20, 30, 40, some estimates of $50 billion. They repressed their people. You couldn't come into the street without being beaten over the head with a police baton or sprayed with tear gas made in Pennsylvania. They were mad at Mubarak, understandably so, and that anger is transferred to us. Same with Ben Ali in Tunisia. The same with Hussein. You will remember, Hussein was our ally before he was our enemy. In the Iran-Iraq war, you had American planes on both sides. We had military advisors supporting Hussein against Iran, but we had F-4 Phantoms flying on Iran's side that were left in there when we left. This goes back a long way. I remember being in high school and being perplexed. Why do the Iranians hate us? Why were they burning our flag? Why were they burning our embassy and jumping up and down like a bunch of idiots, burning our flag? Why did they hate us so much? Because we kept in power a man, the Shah, who they didn't like, who they despised and who was autocratic and had a very uh, significant police force that didn't allow dissent. So really, it's the opposite of what the other side argues for. The other side is arguing that without foreign aid, we'll have war. I'm arguing that because of foreign aid, we have war. Because of foreign aid, and because of the misapplication of foreign aid, and because of the theft of foreign aid, and because foreign aid is given to people who repress their people, the Arab Spring, which has a healthy element to it, has become the Arab winter. If we don't understand that, we're never going to get beyond that. But we have to also go back to the specifics of what I'm asking for in this amendment. In this amendment, what I am asking for is that there simply be restrictions. I'm asking that to get our foreign aid, you have to act like an ally. You have to significantly and believably pledge to protect our embassy. And with Libya's regard, you have to promise to turn over the people who assassinated our, our ambassador. I think that's the minimum of what we do. Frankly, I think we probably shouldn't be sending it at all. I think this is a first step in the right direction to say, for goodness sakes, if we're going to send it to people, at least send it to people who are acting like your allies.
So when you see the American flag being burned in public by tens of thousands of the horde around our embassies around the world, you ask yourself, do you want to send good money after bad to that country? Do you really believe it's working? When you do, when you think about whether your money should go to African despots and dictators, you ask, is that money getting to poor people in Africa, or is foreign aid going to rich people in poor countries? That's the history of it. It's the history of repression. It's the history of human rights abuse. It's the history of theft and more corruption than you can ever imagine. I will probably lose this vote, but I fought long and hard. I fought for six weeks to get this vote, and we're going to have this vote at midnight. People aren't too happy with me now. But we're going to have the vote tonight at midnight, and I think it's an important vote. I think it's an important first step whether we win or lose, because every senator who votes on this tonight will have to go home, and they will have to engage their constituents and explain to their constituents why, why they're still willing to send money to countries that are burning the American flag. Why they're still willing to send money to countries where there's ample evidence of corruption and theft, thievery. Why they're still willing to send foreign aid to countries that are openly disdainful of us. Do you know the president of Afghanistan or senior advisors have said that if there's a war with Pakistan between the United States and Pakistan, they'll side with Pakistan? Pakistan senior advisors have said if there's a war with Iran, they'll side with Iran. These are the people we're still sending billions of dollars to, saying, please be our friends. They laugh at us. They snigger and turn away and say, fools. That's what they say to us. So I say what we need in this country is an American spring. An American spring where we wake up and say, look, to make our country great again, to retain American greatness, we have to figure out how to grow at home and I think that le means leaving more money at home. And I hope the Senate will consider this when they vote on these resolutions this evening. Thank you, Mr. President.